recovering the shapes of objects using uh, image brightness measurements. And we talked at some length about uh, photometric stereo, which was a method that um, gets us the result, but it's kind of unnatural in that it requires multiple exposures. And we're about to transition into uh, shape from shading, which is a method for doing this with a single image. And we've already talked about a um, few different types of uh, surface materials uh, and their reflecting properties. In particular, we talked about the Lambertian surfaces, and we started to talk a little bit about uh, Hapke, which is a model for the reflection from uh, rocky, rocky planets. And I want to introduce a third one, which uh, has to do with microscopy. So <clears throat> and that's a scanning electron microscope. But first, for comparison, uh, here's some pictures of uh, transmission electron microscopes. Um, as you probably know, they allow you to achieve a huge magnification, much larger than with uh, visible light, because you're limited by the uh, wavelength of light. And the wavelength of um, electrons at kilovolt energies is very much shorter, uh, potentially allowing you to image large molecules. And uh, they haven't yet achieved their limit. They theoretically would be able to resolve individual molecules and atoms, and in some, some cases they do. Anyway, if you do a search, uh, electron transmission uh, electron microscope, you click on images, you get all of these uh, pictures of um, these types of microscopes. And uh, then eventually you get to some pictures of things that might have been imaged with an electron microscope, um, <clears throat> like uh, this thing on the right. And this is you know, a cell with a nucleus and some vacuoles and, and so on. Um, and it's you know extremely useful uh, technique for uh, seeing fine detail, um, but it has its limitations in terms of interpretation. So, you know, you look at, well, um, what we will do in a moment is look at the comparison with other kinds of microscopy. So let's see, they, I was going to click on this thing. Um, so, you know, I guess you can sort of make sense of it, but it's, uh, it's a very thin slice of something. Uh, and you'd need to know uh, the details of, of what that is. Now, if in comparison we do a search on the scanning electron microscopes and click on images, we get this. And you have to scroll down before you get a picture of a microscope. Uh, why is that? Well, because scanning electron microscopes make these great pictures that people love. Uh, elect uh, transmission electron microscope make great pictures that you know scientists involved in the research love, but they're not uh, easily interpretable. Whereas these scanning electron microscope pictures, you know, they're very popular. They're, they're just fabulous. I mean, you look at um, you know, look at that. I mean, you can immediately see the head of this uh, jumping spider and uh, its uh, six of its eight eyes and so on. So, and um, why, why is that? You know, beautiful pictures that we find very easy to interpret, know exactly what that is. And this is a surface of who knows what. But you can immediately tell the shape and where the crevices are and so on. So uh, the point is that um, these scanning electron microscopes produce images that we find uh, easy to interpret. So, I don't know, can you think of a reason why we don't find the transmission electron microscope images so easy to interpret, but uh, these, these we can, given where we are in the course? Well, if you look at these pictures, you see that there's a variation in brightness, okay? So that's pretty obvious. But it's a variation that's uh, sort of special. As you approach the edges, uh, things get brighter. Uh, whereas if you're looking at the uh, frontal surface, they're, they're darker. So, right? so there's a variation uh, in brightness depending on surface orientation. Ta-da! That's what we're talking about. 
So the reason we find these images so appealing and easy to interpret is because they have shading. They have a dependence of, surface, uh, of brightness on surface orientation. And um, so, you know, this is obviously the head of some moth. You can see the compound eyes. You can see the schnozzle there all rolled up. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's so easy to see what's going on. There's an alien landing on... Uh... <clears throat> and so the only thing that's a little bit odd is if you look at these uh, shapes, so this is obviously some sort of ovoid football-like shape. Uh, it's bright, it's darkest in the middle, and it gets bright towards the edges. So that's sort of anti-Lambertian, right? With Lambertian, we get the brightest uh, surface reflection where the surface is perpendicular to the incident light, and so we expect that as you approach the occluding contour, it, it gets darker. So if we look at the isophotes on, say, the image of a sphere, it'll, it'll be uh, concentric curves that sort of drop off towards the edge. And these go the other way. Uh, and so that's kind of interesting because uh, if we grew up in a world where most things were sort of Lambertian, we'd get very good at interpreting shape of things uh, that have that type of surface. Uh, and yet, we're able to interpret the shape of, of this very well. And, you know, at, at one point, I had a Europe take a bunch of these pictures and reverse the contrast, because, you know, they should be much easier to interpret. Why didn't anyone think of that? And, uh, well, it was not a very successful Europe assignment, because with the reverse contrast, the pictures didn't look any better. In fact, they were... Uh, marginally harder to interpret, and, and we had some uh, explanations for that. So it, it shows a couple of things. First of all, uh, this modality of microscopic imaging is uh, very uh, nice from our point of view because we can understand these images. We don't need some complicated calculation. And the other one is that the human visual system apparently can do this as well, and it's not hardwired to have any particular um, idea about what the surface material is. It can adapt and deal. I mean, w w we can see that this is not a Lambertian surface. At the same time, we can uh, have a pretty good idea of what the shape is. I mean, maybe not metrically accurate, but uh, that, that's another story. Okay, so that's what we're going to um, talk about uh, next. So let me uh, get rid of that. You know how do we how do we do this? How do we implement this? Yes, I want to shut down. So first, a little note on how these uh, scanning electron microscopes work. You're all probably too young to remember cathode ray tubes, but uh, uh, people used to create images by deflecting uh, electron beams and uh, having them impinge on phosphorus, which would then glow. And those devices had a source of electrons. Basically, you're sort of boiling electrons off some surface. So that's a little heated coil. So that's the source of electrons. And they just sort of bubble off the surface. And then you accelerate them by having some electrode which we'll call the anode. And, um, well, a lot of the electrons end up there. But other electrons are accelerated through. And then we have uh, lenses. And these typically are uh, magnetic. And they, they can also be electrostatic lenses. And the idea is that we're going to focus this beam onto some object. So make some space for some object down here. Um, so. <clears throat> With suitable cleverness and enough money, uh, you can focus that beam down to a very small uh, point. And um, then wh what do you do? Well, the electrons hit that object, and some of them bounce off. So we have uh, backscatter, backscattered electrons. Uh, but uh, most of them penetrate. 
and in the process they lose energy and create uh, secondary electrons. So you can sort of think of them as, you know, bumping into molecules and um, losing some energy and creating, uh, bu bumping electrons off, ionizing things. Uh, and uh, some of those uh, secondary electrons come out of the object. And they're gathered by some kind of electrode, which is also Uh, there are other effects, for example, um, there will be some fluorescence at uh, X-ray energies. So some people uh, measure the X-rays coming off, and there may also be visible light and so on. But we're going to focus on, on the secondary electrons because that's what's uh, used in imaging uh, and creating those images uh, that I showed you. So why, uh, why does the secondary electron current, uh, which we measure here, um, vary with uh, the surface. Well, first of all, the way I've drawn it, uh, it's not a whole lot of use because we just get, you know, one measurement. So what we really want to do is uh, scan this. So some of these electrodes, well, typically it's done magnetically. As you know, an uh, electron in a magnetic field will turn. And so uh, using two orthogonal magnetic fields that you can control from the computer, you can direct that beam anywhere you want and you can scan the object in a raster-like fashion, if you, for example. So, <coughs> this always reminds me of uh, Mr. Uh, Farnborough, who um, has, uh, his claim to fame is that he has a dirt road named after him a few miles from where I live. He's the guy who invented television. Uh, you know, nobody's given any credit for it, uh, and that's because he was uh, a very clever person but not a, a good businessman, and he got shafted by the people who ran RCA, etc. Anyway, probably never heard of him. But when he was asked by a reporter, you know, how did you come up with this idea? I mean, to us now it all seems pretty obvious, but uh, at the time, what was available? Well, there was a telegraph, um, beginnings of telephone, and the qu big question was, you know, uh, audio is a one-dimensional signal, okay, so we understand how to, uh, how to measure that, how to transmit it, how to reproduce it, but, but this is, image is 2D, you know, how do you do that? And there were all kinds of uh, crazy harebrained schemes, <clears throat> and um, supposedly his inspiration were the furrows in his... Uh, father's farm, because I guess he had to walk behind the oxen and uh, hold uh, the plow, and he decided that, well, just as I can plow this whole area by turning it into a 1D problem, I can do the same uh, with images. And, you know, to be honest, I think that's an explanation he came up with when the reporter asked, because a lot of times, you know, people need some way of understanding how on earth you ever got to the solution, and then you have to dream up some reason. So anyway, that's what he did. And that's applied here, so we scan in a raster fashion, and then what do we do? We use the current measured here to modulate a light beam in the display, either another CRT or re uh, read it into a computer and display it on, on an LCD. And then uh, you can control the magnification. Uh, how do you do that? Well, you just control the deflection. So if you um, deflect the uh, beam a lot, you don't get much magnification. And as you reduce the deflection, you get more and more magnification. And so you can get uh, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, um, w compared to optical microscopy, which maxes out uh, below a thousand, pretty much, despite all sorts of incredibly clever tricks. OK. Um, why do we create shaded images? So we have to look at how uh, the surface interacts with the uh, uh, beam. So here's the beam uh, coming in, uh, electrons at several kilo electron volts, and they get hit this material and they start interacting, they bump into things, and they create uh, secondary electrons, uh, and they lose energy as they go. So the first few are rather high energy, and then they get lower energy, and, and those guys bump into things, and, and uh, 
most of those electrons just disappear in, the, in this object, but some of them that are near the surface escape and are uh, measured by our uh, secondary electron collector. And so basically what we're displaying is what fraction of the incoming beam actually makes it back out again. Uh, by the way, one of the limitations is this thing better be conductive because you're pumping all these electrons in there. It's not a huge current, microamp or less, but still you've got a, you know, this insect is in there and you're um, putting a microamp of current in, pretty soon it'll charge up to be some uh, significant fraction of a coulomb and it'll explode. So uh, in order to do this, you typically um, gold plate these objects so that they're conductive. Why gold? Well, because it doesn't outgas. This whole thing has to be done in vacuum. Okay, so that's what we have in the vertical situation. Now imagine that we have a highly inclined uh, uh, beam, uh, surface element. Well now, uh, many more of the electrons are going to escape, right? Because they're generated uh, closer to the surface. So that means the current we measure uh, will be higher when, uh, when we're dealing with a surface that's inclined. And so that, uh, that's it. That's the mechanism for turning surface orientation into brightness, and our job is to, to invert that. Uh, so one way we can understand this is to plot the uh, reflectance map, which we've already done for Lambertian surfaces and uh, Hopke surfaces. Brightness versus orientation. So in this case, um, coming straight down means that we get a relatively dark image because a lot of the secondary electrons are just uh, uh, never going to make it out of the surface. Then, as we go to higher surface inclination, uh, it gets brighter because more of the secondary electrons escape. And in uh, typical arrangements, the thing is uh, axially symmetric. So whether these electrons come out in this direction or that direction, if they get out of the surface, they're going to be counted. And so that means that this is going to be symmetric. And so if we plot the isophotes, we're going to get uh, something like that. Well, you know, put numbers on it. Where it gets uh, uh, bigger, the further uh, out we get, the more inclined the surface is. And yes, you can uh, modify this. You can, uh, you know, remove some of the collectors or wire this collector to a different sensor and so on and make this uh, asymmetrical, but the standard way of using it is just to um, measure the total secondary electron current, and, uh, and that gives us uh, that type of reflectance map. Okay, so now if I measure the brightness at a particular point in the image, uh, I get the slope of the surface. So I can directly translate that. You know, if it's 0.7, then the slope is whatever that distance from the origin is. Um, but uh, I don't get the uh, gradient. Right, what I'd like to know is what's the surface orientation? And as usual, we've got two unknowns, P and Q. We only have one constraint. We measure the brightness. And so, yes, we've reduced the number of possibilities, but we still have a one-dimensional uh, infinite set of uh, possibilities. And so, so, you know, slope... Uh, typically is thought of as a scalar, uh, whereas this is a vector. So it's a little bit like speed versus velocity. I mean, not everyone agrees on those definitions, but to me, uh, speed is uh, a scalar quantity, you know, going 50 miles an hour, whereas velocity is a directed vector. Uh, so, okay. So... Um, what to do? Well, it's just another example of uh, this shape from shading problem. We're going to have some distribution of some pattern of brightness, and our job is to uh, estimate what the surface shape is, and we have uh, a reflectance map to help us with that uh, because it allows us to look up for any particular brightness we measure uh, what the slope is. Unfortunately, not the gradient. If it was the gradient, then... 
we would be uh, in better shape. And we're going to do this uh, for various special cases and then for the general case where we can use any reflectance map we like. And, and that's important because we don't want this to only work for, say, Lambertian surfaces or uh, the lunar surface or whatever. So. Okay. <coughs> so wh when you get a chance, you know, look up uh, scanning electron microscope images and just marvel at the wonderful world that exists there and how we're able to understand it uh, so well. And, um, you know, puzzles like, uh, why is it that if you reverse the contrast, it's not easier to interpret the image, which is sort of what you'd expect. You'd expect that a surface that's brightest where it's facing you would be easier to understand that than one that's darkest. Um, okay. <clears throat> so uh, in preparation for this, I want to talk a little bit about uh, how to go from a needle diagram to shape. Now, wh what we, wh where we're going with this is we're going directly to a method that takes us from a single image to a shape. But meantime, we have some tools, and I want to um, exploit those tools. So, for example, what's a needle diagram? Well, it's just um, a surface orientation at every uh, pixel. So, yeah, and what, what are the needles? Well, if you can think of each facet of the surface as having a, a normal that's sticking out, and you're looking down at that normal. That, that's the needle. And the um, view of it, um, you may remember from the very first uh, la class, uh, if you're looking straight down perpendicular to the surface, then that needle is just a point. And if it's not, then it'll be pointing in a direction that tells you what the surface gradient direction is. And the length of it will tell you how steep the surface is. So uh, where do we get these? Well, we're not going to get them from there. So there's more work to be done. But uh, for example, we, we get this from uh, photometric stereo. So in photometric stereo, we're not computing z as a function of x and y. Uh, what we're getting instead is uh, p and q as a function of x and y. Of course, remembering that you know p is dz dx and q is dz dy. Well, it's um, it's our estimate based on our uh, image brightness measurements. So, uh, okay. So that seems uh, actually like a very simple problem. Um, why? Well, uh, in the discrete case, we have a number of unknowns equal to the number of pixels. We're trying to recover z at every pixel, let's say. So there are you know, millions of unknowns. But at every pixel, we also have um, two pieces of information, p and q. So if we have a million pixel image, we have two million pieces of information. So it's, uh, it's overdetermined. We actually have more information than we need. And as we saw, uh, that's always handy, because that means that uh, we will be able to reduce noise and get a better result than if it wasn't overdetermined. So in fact, we have twice as many constraints as, as they are known. OK, so what can we do? Well, one thing we can do is, suppose we start here and just integrate out uh, p, which is dz dx, uh, along this axis. And what we'll get is the change in height. So z of x is z of, let's say, 0. Suppose we start at the origin plus uh, from 0 to x. Um, right, because dz dx is the derivative, you integrate the derivative, yeah. you, know, you, you know all that. So, Okay, so I can get the height anywhere along the x-axis, and similarly I can get the height anywhere along the y-axis, 
by integrating uh, the other thing I know. So uh, then from there, I can combine them and I can go partway up on the y-axis and across on the x-axis, or I can get partway on the x -axis. So I can fill in the whole area uh, in various ways like this. And actually, you know, I could take a curve. So let's take that curve. And so along that curve, what we're looking at is um, a combination. Right, so um, what is this? Well, that's just the dot product of the gradient, pq dot dx dy. So that just tells me the change in height. So this is actually uh, delta z, if you like. Uh, that's the change in height if I take a small step in the x direction and a small step in the y direction. Okay, Pre pretty obvious. And so I can do that for all these points. I just pick contours and integrate out. Well, um, that's okay, uh, but what if somebody else comes along and says, oh, I don't like the contour you chose. I'm going to go this way. And what you'd hope, of course, is they get the same answer. But there's no guarantee of that, right? Because these P and Qs are determined experimentally. They're subject to measurement noise. So they're not perfect. They're not, they're not actually the derivatives of Z with respect to X and the derivative of Z with respect to Y. They are our estimates, which include some noise. So, OK, well, <coughs> what we'd hope is that they'd come out the same. And what that means is that actually what we're hoping is that if you go around the loop, right, if we go this way da, 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 up there and then we come back, um, what, what should this equal? Zero. So that should be zero, yes, thank you. And every, every jogger knows that that's not true. If you uh, jog in a loop, you seem to be going uphill all the way. Okay, I guess we don't have many joggers here. So, or it's like, um, well, okay. So um, that should be true. So um, th there's no guarantee that when we measure P and Q experimentally, we estimate them that, that this is going to be true. So what do we do with that? Well, uh, one thing we can think about is uh, turning this into some sort of condition on P and Q. Uh, that is, P and Q have to satisfy some constraint for this to be true. And this has to be true for any, any loop, not, not just that one. And I can decompose a large loop like that into a uh, small loop. So suppose, suppose it's true for, for that loop. Uh, well, then I can put another loop next to it. Uh, and another loop. And now, <clears throat> rather than go around these four loops, I can eliminate the inner parts, uh, and they cancel each other. See, if I'm going from here to there, and then I'm going from there to here, I'm back at the same place. So, so this is a, a crude way of proving that if it's true for a small loop, for any small loop, I can decompose any large loop into lots of small loops, and then it's going to be true for, for the large loop as well. So, uh, okay, so let's see what. So, uh, let's. Uh, have a small loop of size delta x in this direction and delta y in that direction. And let's suppose that this is the point x, y. And let's see how the height changes as we uh, go around this loop. So start, at, start down here, say. Um, well, uh, then we need to know what the slope is in the um, x direction. So that's uh, p. And let's take the slope at the center of this stretch which is going to be p of x and 
y minus delta y over 2. And that's the slope, and we're going delta x with that slope. So we, we make this loop, loop small enough so that uh, we can use this linear approximation that um, the slope is pretty much constant uh, over that stretch. Then we go up. Okay, so that's going to be, we need the slope in the y direction, which is q. And we'll take the slope and estimate it based on the center of this line. So that's at x plus delta x over 2 and delta y, uh, and y, sorry. And then we go across the top, minus p x y plus delta y over 2. Oh, this is times delta y. And then we go down, so it's minus q. And that should be 0. We should be back uh, at ground 0. <coughs> so um, what we get here is um, if we do the Taylor series expansion of that, we get uh, and down here we get p of x comma y. plus higher order terms. And then we expand this. We get uh, q of x comma y plus delta x over 2 qx. Um, let's see. Plus. OK, and of course, um, these terms cancel. So we end up with um, uh, Py delta x delta y minus uh, Qx delta x delta y is 0. Or in other words, these two are the same and cancel out the, uh, the size of this little box. And so we get Py is Qx. So um, if this is true of uh, very small areas, then that condition has, has to be true. And um, that makes sense because, you know, P was supposed to be uh, our measurement of the ZDX, and Q was supposed to be our measurement of the ZDY. And so, so that's uh, z sub x, y, and that's z sub uh, y, x. Uh, now, of, it's slightly confusing because that's obviously true of the original surface as long as it's you know, smooth enough uh, that the mixed partial derivatives in the, don't depend on the order. Okay, so if p and q really were the derivatives of the surface z of x, y, then this would be true. Uh, but we're measuring them from uh, experimental data, so this typically uh, won't be true. And if we take this integral, uh, we will get uh, different results depending on different directions. And so, so this, is a little, this is like you know, uh, over-determined linear equations. There's no solution. Uh, all we can do is uh, find some least squares approximation. So same here. Um, there, there is no surface, uh, z of x, y, that will give us exactly the p and q that we measured from uh, photometric stereo or some other vision method. OK. Now, actually, um, we can get there a more elegant way, which is handy because we'll use this again uh, later. So. Like many important theorems, this one has many names. Uh, I guess it's uh, attributed to Gauss, and it's, it's a special case of more general theorems used in fluid dynamics. But what it does is it relates a contour integral to an area integral. 
let's draw some sort of shape. So L is this uh, contour, and uh, D is, is that area. So, you know, why do we care? Well, in machine vision, often we have computations that uh, take us over all pixels, and there are a lot of pixels. Anytime you can reduce that computation to a computation about the boundary of a region alone, you've got a huge win. You're down from you know, millions of calculations to thousands of calculations. So there are several places in machine vision where uh, we use a trick like this <coughs> to uh, turn an integral over an area into an integral over a, just a curve <coughs> uh, with a huge benefit. Of course, you know, this is a very specialized thing. There are only that many things that have this special property. So, namely things that can be written in this form. But, you know, suppose, for example, you want to compute the area of a blob. Well, you can count the pixels. You can just go row by row by row, see, okay, this pixel's in the blob, that one's not, and so on. Or you can just trace the outline. Turns out you can compute the area just by tracing the outline. In fact, there used to be a wonderful instrument which is fiendishly difficult to understand, but it allowed people to um, compute integrals um, in an analog fashion. Okay, it's, uh, you should look it up. It's an instrument that uh, often was made out of precious metals because it was only for uh, special people like surveyors. And you would uh, basically hold one part of it and trace the outline uh, and um, compute the area. Once you complete the loop, you've computed the area. You can read it off the instrument. And that's an example where we're turning an area integral, you know, the integral of one over that area, into a contour integral. Uh, as you go around the edge, there's a little wheel that slips on the paper in just the right way and so on. So this isn't just you know, something useful in digital domain. It's been used in the analog uh, world as well. Uh, so area is an example of something where this is a useful formula because we can compute area by doing something on the boundary instead of doing something in the interior. But it turns out that um, there are lots of other things we want to do. For example, in vision, often we want to know where something is. And in a simple case, you know, it's a blob. Uh, and where is it? Well, uh, the centroid's a very good way of talking about the position of a blob in an image. And so how do you compute the centroid? Well, again, you can go pixel by pixel and uh, accumulate x times something, throw it in the accumulator, and when you're done, uh, you divide and you get the centroid. Uh, or you can go around the boundary, which is much faster. <coughs> and uh, continuing along that line of reasoning, uh, there are things called moments of which the centroid computation is the first and the area component uh, computation is the zeroth. But generally, you can compute moments by just going around the boundary. And moments are useful in describing shapes. You know, so, so far, we talked about area and position, centroid. Uh, but you might also want to be able to say something like, oh, it's, it's elongated. Um, and so uh, these moments are useful for that. And they can all be computed uh, in this uh, clever way. So let's apply uh, Green's theorem. The, you know, there's a 3D version of that, uh, turning 3D integral volume integrals into surface area integrals. But since our images are 2D, we, we typically don't need that. OK, so we, we apply this to our problem. So we, we're trying to match you know, something in this formula with what we were doing, and I guess we had uh, PDX plus QDY up here. So let's try that. Let's try using uh, Green's theorem. Uh, so M is Q, P, Q, D, X, minus uh, L is P. And uh, we're saying that uh, that is zero, right? We're going around the loop. OK. And this has to be true for uh, all, not just you know, a particular loop, but any loop, small loop, large loop, whatever. 
And that can only be true if dq dx equals dp dy. Right? Because suppose that dp, uh, suppose that uh, that quantity, that integrand was non-zero at some point. All I need to do is construct a loop that includes that point, and I'd have a contradiction. Right? So um, that, again, confirms the conclusion we arrived at painfully here by making a small square and then using Taylor series. Uh, this is a slightly more uh, elegant way of getting to the same thing. OK. So um, what, what to do? Our P and Q do not satisfy that constraint. So we could try and introduce that as a constraint. We could say, OK, find the z of x and y that has these p's and q's as derivatives approximately, uh, and also satisfy that constraint. Well, we haven't talked about how to uh, solve constraint optimization problems. That's a little harder than the least squares we've done so far. So let's uh, try a different tack. <coughs> so let's uh, basically you know, do just brute force uh, least squares. So we're trying to look for a surface Z such that um, such that, that is the smallest possible. Right? So ideally, if there was no measurement error and we had the correct surface, then there was a z such that its x derivative matched the p we computed from the image, and its y derivative uh, matched the uh, sorry the q the p that we got from the image, and this one matched the q that we got from the image. But because of measurement noise, we uh, expect that will not be possible. So let's at least try and make it as small as possible. Okay. So that's the um, least squares problem in a nutshell. And, uh, well, uh, you know, we solve it as usual. We, we just differentiate with respect to z. Yes, can we do that? What is z? Is z a parameter? Right, so no, unfortunately, we can't do that. Right? If we had a finite number of knobs we could turn, parameters, variables, uh, then we just differentiate with respect to each of them and set the result equal to zero, and, we, and we're done. That, that's what we've been doing. Uh, unfortunately, uh, z here is a function. And so you know, there's no sort of sensible way of talking about the derivative with respect to a function. So it, it has not a finite number of degrees of freedom. It has an infinite number of degrees of freedom. And uh, there's a subject in mathematics uh, that deals with that, calculus of variations. And it's called that because basically you say something like, suppose that z is the solution, then if I make any small variation on z, that integral should go up. And, uh, Based on that very sensible idea, you can come up with some equations for solving that problem. But we're going to you know, remain in the trenches and work with the discrete version for a moment. <coughs> because, uh, And this particular uh, problem is pretty simple. The reason to work through it in detail is because it hides a lot of the pitfalls that you might run into when you solve a more complicated problem. Okay, so the discrete case, in the discrete case, we don't have a function of x and y. What we have is a bunch of discrete values on a grid, right? So a finite number of unknowns, maybe huge, maybe a million. And so, but we can use calculus, ordinary calculus, just differentiate with respect to each of them, set the result equal to zero. So true, we're going to get a lot of equations. But you know our methods apply. We, we don't need to invent something new. So this is what we're looking for. And what we're given is, again, a uh, set of uh, gradients uh, on a grid uh, with measurement noise in them. And we're trying to find um, a value of z at every grid point that will um, 
make the error as small as possible, where the error is the discrete equivalent of, of this thing. So let's look at that. So i and j are uh, row and column numbers. So, you know, slight, slight um, uh, annoyance here for computer scientists and mathematicians, which is that you would like the first discrete index to correspond to x and the second discrete index to correspond to y. And, you know, as a student, I had a real hard time with that. But, of course, in mathematics, uh, we count uh, rows down and columns across, and we write them ij in the other order. And, and also with I reverse. But, okay, so this is, what is this? We're trying to estimate the derivative in the x direction, and that's why we're varying y rather than I, right? And so this is our estimate of the derivative in the x direction, and that should be uh, small. We, we, excuse me, it should match what we observed uh, from the image. <coughs> and we also need to add in The other term, we also want to match the derivative uh, in the y direction. And now typically, there aren't the set of values of z that will make both of those terms zero. So we kind of compromise. We just want to make them as small as possible. So we're going to minimize this. And what can we minimize? Well, uh, we have the set of uh, zij's. OK. <coughs> Um, so, uh, we then differentiate, and set the result equal to zero for, for all possible values of ij. So if the image has a million pixels, there'll be a, a million equations uh, coming from that. Fortunately, because we picked least squares, um, the equations are all going to be linear. So, so a, as much as the Disadvantages to using least squares, such as not being robust against outliers, uh, we can solve these equations because they're just going to be linear equations. Okay, so here, pay attention, big problem. If you differentiate with respect to z, i, j, you get the wrong answer. Uh, why is that? Well, i, j up here, these are dummy variables, right? You can't if I replace ij with alpha and beta, it's the same sum. But then if you differentiate with respect to zij, so uh, another way of thinking about it in programming language terms, you know, you've got an identifier collision. You, you're using i and j to mean one thing in here, and now you're trying to make it mean something else. So, so here we have a sum of all possible ij's, and now you're going to differentiate. So, uh, long story short, pick some other identifier names. And, you know, you might think, okay, that's kind of obvious. Yes, but there have been papers published that got this wrong, so. So, it's, it's possible. It can happen. Okay, so, um, well, this sounds kind of messy because we have a sum over a million terms, you know, and now we're going to differentiate. But the good thing is that Yes, we have a lot of equations, but all, they're all very sparse. Because, you know, if you think about, okay, anything here having to do uh, with row 1,000, when you differentiate with respect to z in row 990, it's not going to have any effect. So all of those derivatives are zero, except a, a small number. Okay, the small number where kl matches up with an index in here, ij or KL matches IJ plus 1, or KL matches I plus 1J. That's it, three terms. So we're going to have a lot of equations, each of which has three terms in this case. Okay, so let's try that. So uh, let's first try where we match uh, KL is I comma J. So th there's a square. So differentiate that, we get two times that uh, 
times the derivative of the thing inside with respect to uh, zkl, which is going to be minus 1 over epsilon. Right, so it's a square, we get twice that term, and then we have to differentiate what's inside with respect to zkl, and we said that it matches this term, so it's going to be minus 1 over epsilon. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm going over this in a very pedestrian way, but it's, we, we, you'll need to do this in a more complicated example, and it's, it's easy to not do it right. So, Okay, so that's that one. But there's also this match. So we have to add to this two times uh, this term. So we get twice this term and then differentiate this with respect to zkl, which is matching that. So that gives me minus 1 over epsilon again. OK, so that's, uh, there are two terms. Then we also have to consider where KL is I uh, J plus 1. In other words, K is I, L is J plus 1, or conversely, J is L minus 1. Right? So we differentiate with respect to that. We get 2 times this. OK, no, K. So we get twice that term, and we have to differentiate what's inside with respect to zkl, which matches that one. So it's going to be one plus 1 over epsilon. And we're almost done. Just one more term. We, we, this one here, uh, now we have k comma l is i plus 1 j. Or in other words, k matches i plus 1, meaning i is k minus 1, and l is just j. So we get that one that's going to be z k l minus z. OK, i is l mi k minus 1, l over epsilon minus. And plus 1 over epsilon. So <clears throat> and all of that's supposed to be 0, right? That's the uh, least squares method. And this is going to be true for you know, all points in the image. Not so uh, fortunately, this simplifies. So first of all, of course, I can ignore the 2, because if twice something is 0, then something is 0. So forget the 2. Uh, I could also cancel out one of the epsilons, but I'll keep them just uh, for reasons that will become apparent. OK, so now I'm going to gather up the terms. Let me first gather up all the terms in P. Well, there are only two of them, so that's pretty straightforward. So I get uh, PKL minus PKL minus 1 divided by epsilon. So, so the, those two terms. And let me gather up all the terms in Q. Uh, so I get um, QKL minus Q k minus 1 l over epsilon. And then let me gather up all the terms in z. Uh, well, there are a bunch more of those. So, um, and they're, they're 1 over epsilon squared. So let me write that out front. So we're going to have minus z k l plus 1 minus z k plus 1 l minus z k l minus 1 minus z k minus 1 l. And then uh, zkl occurs four times. Well, let me just keep the uh, epsilon squared. And all of that's supposed to be 0. Uh, so what, what are those terms? Well, this, this looks awfully like. Uh, the x derivative of, of p, right? Because we take the value of p at two positions separated in x and we divide by epsilon. So, you know, we can uh, think of this as p sub x. And this looks awfully like a uh, y derivative of uh, q. And then I, I claim that this thing here corresponds to the Laplacian of z. Uh, let me let me see why. Uh, 
Okay, so I can draw a little diagram here uh, and gather up all these terms. So I get 1 over epsilon squared, and I have uh, 4 for KL, and then minus 1 for all of the neighbors. And now uh, Z sub XX Okay, so th those things I'm drawing down there are variously called, you know, computational molecules or stencils or something like that. And um, there are, they're a graphic way of uh, showing how to compute a estimate a derivative. Now, I didn't bother uh, for these, but I could. So I could, for example, that's the computational molecule for the x derivative. And then here's the computational molecule for, for the y derivative. You know, but it's, it's so obvious we don't even uh, bother with that. But when we get to higher derivatives, it's handy to draw these diagrams. So, uh, so if we convolve this with itself, remember 603, uh, then you get, you get that. And if you convolve this with itself, you get this second derivative, right? So just you know, how do you convolve? You uh, flip and shift. Anyway, uh, you could also get this from Taylor series or any other, any number of other methods uh, for estimating derivatives. Okay, so then if we combine these two, if we add these two, we get that diagram, well, except for the sign. So this is actually minus the Laplacian. But it occurs on the same side of the equal sign, so when we move it to the other side, it becomes plus the Laplacian. So the Laplacians actually are heavily used in uh, uh, machine vision, particularly uh, pre-processing. So you know we should become familiar with it. Uh, so, by the way, another way of writing it is, is that, and you know engineers have a different point of view on that as mathematicians. I, I gather mathematicians prefer the first way of writing the Laplacian and um, you know, fluid dynamics people like, like the other one, but whatever, it's the Laplacian. So the Laplacian is an interesting operator from many points of view. Uh, you know, it, it's a derivative operator. We've already seen the brightness gradient plays an important role. First derivatives. Uh, for some operations on images, we would like things to be rotationally invariant. In other words, if you are performing some image operation, enhancing edge detection, you don't want to depend on your choice of x, y coordinate system. So that when you turn the coordinates, you would expect things to work out pretty much the same. Of course, they'll have different coordinates, but you know, they'll be in the corresponding place. So one of the big questions is, are there derivative operators, which are very useful in edge detection, that are rotationally symmetric, so that when you rotate the coordinate system, they do the same thing. Well, uh, the Laplacian is the first, the lowest order linear uh, combination, uh, derivative combination that does that. It doesn't look like it, does it? Because we're adding a uh, second partial derivative with respect to x and the second partial derivative with respect to y. Um, but if you go through the painful pain and agony of changing coordinate systems and computing the first derivative and then computing the second derivatives and you add them up and magically uh, in the new coordinate system you get exactly the same. So suppose we have a coordinate system like this and then we go to a rotated coordinate system. It turns out that Zx prime that uh, in that rotated coordinate system, the Laplacian is the same. I'll spare you the details. It's pretty boring. But it, this, was, this makes the Laplacian of a lot of interest in all sorts of uh, image processing operations uh, because it is rotationally symmetric. Of course, on a discrete grid, we're going to be somewhat biased anyway. Like, you know, does this look rotationally symmetric? Well, uh, not terribly. So they're actually better approximations if you're on a square grid 
and, and we'll talk about them. And if you're not on a square grid, you can do even better. For example, if you're on a um, hexagonal grid, you can get a better approximation. Anyway, back to this. So w what we've done over here is uh, we've bypassed the calculus of variation for the moment, and we somewhat painfully went into the discrete world of discrete pixels, and we found an uh, equation that has to be true at every uh, pixel in order for this to be a uh, least square solution. That is, this is a solution that minimizes that error. It's, it's the best fit. It's, it's as good as uh, we can get. And then sort of looking at this formula here, we decided, oh, maybe that's the discrete version of that continuous equation. And uh, that's exactly right, because if we use the calculus of variation, uh, we go directly to that in one step. So why didn't we do that? Well, because there's this huge learning curve. So this one step after you do a lot of stuff, and I didn't want to do that right now. So anyway, what do we do with these equations? How do we solve them? Of course, we can, they're linear equations. So we can use uh, Gaussian elimination you know, or some perhaps slightly more sophisticated algorithm, uh, all of which take a long time for uh, lots of equations. Um, <clears throat> Right? Typically, they go as something like n cubed. Or if you're you know, a complexity theory person, n to the 2.76 or whatever, uh, <clears throat> with a very large multiplier in front. So, but whatever, once n is a, a million or 10 million, that's a large number. And it, uh, it's not likely you're actually going to be doing that. So um, what to do instead? Well, the great thing is that we have uh, a sparse set of equations. So we got a million equations, but each of them only has a handful of terms in it. Right? So they, they only involve, um, each equation only involves uh, five uh, values of z. So we got, you know, you th think of writing them out, there's a million rows of these, but each row only has five non-zero elements. Well, it turns out uh, we can then solve this iteratively pretty simply. <laughs> And, um, of course, it's easy to propose an iterative solution. It's hard to show that it converges. So we leave out that part, and we'll just uh, <coughs> appeal to the textbooks that say that it does converge. So uh, what can we do here? Well, we can pull out uh, one of these terms and pretend that we, we know, we have an initial guess. So we know what these values are uh, at the moment. And we're going to compute a new value for, for this one. So um, let's see if I got it written down or not. So I'm going to use a subscript in parentheses as a way of indicating the iteration step. So this is step n plus 1. And that's step n. Okay, um, I almost wrote the uh, superscript uh, parenthesis n here for the n step, but no, th these are from the image. They're fixed. Uh, once we've processed the images, uh, that's uh, given. Uh, it's the only thing that might change is, is this lot. Well, what, what is that? Well, that's a local average. And in our case, with that computational molecule, Um, that looks like that. So um, the iterative step is very simple. We go to a particular pixel, and we get a new value by taking the average of the neighbor, neighbors in, from the previous step. And then we add in this correction here, which is based on the uh, image information. 
Uh, and wh what does this do? Well, it brings us closer to satisfying the Laplacian condition. That, you know, because this is the estimate of P sub X, and this is the estimate of Q sub Y, and so, uh, the, and uh, the difference between this and that is our estimate of the Laplacian. So as we go along, um, we uh, adjust that pixel value using that very simple equation. So here's where the sparseness comes in. You know, it would, this wouldn't be very useful if we had a million terms in this, but we've only got, uh, you know, four, four neighbors to consider. And you can show that this converges. Uh, we won't do that. And um, it's going to be very much faster than trying to solve it with Gaussian elimination, particularly since, you know, you don't need infinite precision. You can stop after a certain point and, uh, and uh, relax. Uh, so, a couple of things to point out. First of all, uh, this is closely related to uh, solving the heat equation. This, this type of uh, iteration, because the heat equation is a second order PDE, just like the equation we have. Um, it's also uh, the diffusion equation. And so, um, so there are loads of uh, techniques available from other fields that tell us how to do this efficiently, how to do it in parallel, and you know, wh whatever. So th again, the idea is you step through the pixels, and at each pixel, you compute the average of the neighbors, and then add in a correction term, and that's the new value, and you just keep on doing that. Now, for a start, you don't have to do this sequentially as uh, Farnborough did, uh, you know, the rows of his field. Um, you can do this in any order you want. And in fact, there are advantages in terms of convergence uh, if you do that. Uh, also, <coughs> um, you can parallelize this. You can do as many of these you like that um, in parallel, as long as they don't touch each other. Right? So if you are making a change to a pixel based on some neighbor, you do not want a computation that changes the neighbor at the same time step. But that, that's uh, huge because, you know, we, we, just, we can divide the image into, I don't know, uh, nine sub-images, uh, th little three-by-three three blocks. And while we're operating on this one, we're not allowed to touch uh, these others. But that's fine. That means we can uh, have huge parallelism. You know, a million pixels divided by nine. Uh, well, we probably don't have 110,000 processors, but... So uh, we can do something slightly more intelligent. Anyway, the methods numer for numerically solving these equations are, are well known, and it's a, a very stable uh, problem in, in the sense that if there's a noise in your measurements, it, it'll still converge, it'll still work, and everything uh, will be cool. Okay, so... Um, okay, we have a bit of time. So what, what have we done? Well, what we've done right now is um, learn some techniques because, in a way, this isn't directly useful uh, except for the case of photometric stereo, and we now want to move on from photometric stereo. But the, the kind of tools like this discretization and you know, avoiding the conflict of identifiers um, and then looking at the terms and seeing, oh, this is an approximation of the derivative. Uh, those will uh, reoccur, so it, it was good that we did this. But uh, beyond that, uh, this shows you if you have photometric stereo data, uh, you can reconstruct the surface in a least squares way and get a, a, a reasonable solution that matches the experimental data. Okay, now we're, now we're going to go back to uh, the, the somewhat more challenging problem of... Uh, Single image, mono, uh, single image uh, reconstructions. And we've sort of solved one case already, which is if the surface had these very special properties. Right? So we had, uh, let, let's just uh, go over that a little bit. Uh, so this was. Uh, Brightness was a function of that, which was 
uh, into the end. And in this case, the reflectance map was very simple. We had these parallel lines. That they won't be equally spaced because of the square root, but they're parallel lines. And each of them has the 1 plus PSP plus QSQ equals a constant. So the isophotes in the reflectance map are these uh, parallel straight lines. Um, and that's actually what allowed us to uh, solve the problem. Because then we said, well, uh, suppose I rotate to a somewhat more useful coordinate system. Uh, in that coordinate system, I can just determine the uh, slope in that special direction. So if I read off you know, brightness value like this, uh, in the original coordinate system, you know, it's a linear relationship between P and Q. But in the new coordinate system, it's uh, conveniently giving me an exact value of P prime. Uh, and it tells me nothing about uh, Q prime. So I've sort of uh, maximized the information in one direction and made it worse in, in another direction. And I, I'm just going to write this down. I'm not going to do this carefully. But uh, it turns out that we will need to deal with these coordinate transformations at some point. So, oops. So. <clears throat> oh, and what is this angle? Let's call it theta s. Um, I, since that ray, uh, that axis p prime, is perpendicular to all of these lines, right? I'm going to have that p comma q dot uh, p s uh, q s. Um, is going to allow me to determine that <coughs> that angle is given by this triangle, uh, QS. So I can, uh, well, might as well write it down. So whatever the light source position is, I can figure out what that angle is. Uh, so, uh, so actually, the light source is somewhere along this line. It's, let's say it's up here. OK. Um, now, what I want to do is rotate the image ahead of time. So uh, to make this um, unnecessary later. So uh, how, what's the relationship? Well, you know, you, I'm sure you know this. And we can call it theta s or just theta for simplicity. OK. Uh, but what we need is a relationship between p and q and p prime and q prime. So we need dz dx prime is dz dx 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 prime plus dz dy dy dx prime. Um, and of course, this is p prime that I want to go for. This is p. Uh, this is q. And so I'm left with, with that. Well, annoyingly, that's going the wrong way. Right? So I actually need the inverse transform of this. So what's the inverse of rotating through theta? It's rotating through minus theta. Right? So x is x prime cos theta minus y prime sine theta. And y is? Uh, x prime sine theta plus. OK, so then this is uh, dx dx prime is cosine theta. And this is dy dx prime, so that's sine theta. So actually, I got p prime is p cosine theta plus q sine theta. And similarly, I'm going to get q prime is minus p sine. So this is um, and, uh, nice. And you might say, well, I could have guessed that, right? Because it has the same form. Well, think again. 
Because when you get to the second derivative, this doesn't work. You can't just guess the answer. And that may be relevant because we will be talking about, you were talking about the Laplacian. So right there, if you were trying to prove that theorem I said about rotational symmetry, you'd need to get second derivatives and then uh, this wouldn't work. Anyway, uh, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to rotate uh, these coordinate systems. And then I'm going to end up with, uh, with something like which relates the uh, image measurements to the slope. And, and you know, the, the, the details of the equation isn't so important. What's important is that I can be at a particular point in the image. I read off the brightness, and I compute this quantity. The other things are all known. I know where the light source is. And I've got the slope, which is amazing. I have the slope of the surface in a, in a particular direction. And the, you know the, that's uh, enough. I, we can uh, now reconstruct the surface. But this, but this did require that we uh, rotate the coordinate system, that we have a particular direction, and that's going to be true in the general case. So this is only for Hapke, uh, where we have nice uh, straight line isophotes in the reflections map. Uh, but uh, we'll generalize that. And um, Okay, so what do we do with that? Well, we went over this a little bit last time because uh, we can just integrate out, uh, you know, z of x is... Right, so we have the slope. We just integrate it out, or, or you know, in, in terms of discrete implementation, we're here. Uh, we go a small distance delta x, like I don't know, pixel. Uh, we know the slope, so we know how much uh, z is changing, right? So we have a new value of z, and then we we look at the image and say, what's the brightness here? And using that formula, we find a new value for p prime, and we uh, you know continue we take another little step, delta x, and we get there, and so on. And so we can build up a uh, shape in the discrete world, and we can go the other direction as well. We can go minus delta x and build up a profile uh, this way. So that's uh, kind of amazing that you can do that. Well, that's a single profile, but now in the image uh, we have uh, the y direction to deal with as well. But we can do this for any y. Right? We, but in each case, we're, we're confined to running along a row. There's no interaction between the rows. We just treat it as a 1D problem along, along each row. Uh, we read off the brightness at each pixel. We convert it to the slope using that formula and then uh, use that slope to see uh, wh where we go. So there are a couple of things uh, about this that are interesting. So one is that if I add a constant to z, uh, does anything change? Um, <coughs> so in fact, let's, let's go back to, to this one up here, this overdetermined uh, problem, uh, which has now sort of disappeared. Um, uh, if you, if you add a constant to z, does the Laplacian of z change? No, right? So uh, that's interesting because that means that, okay, you can recover z, but actually the absolute height of z you don't know. And that's reasonable because if brightness depends on surface orientation, then moving the surface up and down shouldn't have any effect. And in particular, in the case of orthographic projection, it, it doesn't change in any way. It's, it's not even magnifying or minifying or something. And so similarly here, uh, you know, the shading information tells us nothing directly about depth, only about relative depth. You know, what's the slope of the surface? And so here, um, to, to actually get a reconstruction, I need an initial value. 
for, for z. And, um, well, uh, that's a problem. Now, if it was just uh, an over, like in the case of the Laplacian solution, if it's just an overall uh, change in, in height, that would be easy to de deal with. That's just one unknown. But here, uh, we potentially have a different initial value for every row that we're integrating along. So, so you can imagine that you know, we're computing these solutions and uh, we have, have an initial value, say, here, and we integrate it out. But we can pick those independently, or somebody could go there and measure it. But, but that sort of defeats the purpose. You know, we're trying to find the surface shape of the moon before anyone goes there. And so having someone go there and survey it uh, kind of defeats the purpose. Although it does mean that you only have to survey one curve and then everything else uh, sprouts off uh, from that. And we already talked about you know, various heuristics to try and build something even though uh, we, we don't know that. So um, we don't need to have these initial points along the y-axis though. We could have uh, initial points along any, any curve. So that means what we actually need is an initial curve doesn't really really matter what the curve is as, as, as long as it's not parallel to the x prime axis. Okay, and then now we can map this back into our original the unrotated world and um, <clears throat> these profiles now will run at an angle and we have some sort of initial curve here. Now let me introduce uh, coordinates. Uh, let's call uh, the initial curve is some function of eta. So initial curve is x of eta, y of eta, uh, z of eta. Right, so we'll assume that's given. And then we uh, go uh, away from that using some other parameter, uh, chi. And uh, that's our x prime in this case, but w we want to uh, generalize that. So this is going to be very similar to the um, uh, general method. And so uh, we, we take a step delta x along this curve, which would be you know, a, a step in x prime. And because of the rotation, So this is the, the scheme we're following. So uh, we're exploring the surface by moving along these curves. And you know, from step to step, uh, this is what we do. We have delta x and delta y change in a way uh, that's uh, at an angle, theta s, in this original xy coordinate system. I've gone back to that system because in general, we won't be able to use this trick. It's only for Hopka surfaces that it works. And so you can see the numerical calculation is very straightforward. Uh, we pick up the image brightness, we plug it into this formula, and we get a step in the z direction. And so we just continue doing that and explore that curve. And then we do the same for the next curve. And they can be computed independently, so you can do them in parallel if you want. Um, just one little note. Um, you can change the speed that you explore the solution in, in, right? Because if I, if this tells me to take a step delta x, delta y, delta z, maybe I'll take two delta x, two delta y, two delta z, or a half. And how would I decide? Well, suppose that you only move a hundredth of a pixel. That's probably a, a bad choice for increment. Or suppose you move 10 pixels. That's a bad choice for increment. You want to reduce it. 
And the convenient thing is we can easily change the speed. We just multiply all three of them by the same constant. And, and so, uh, you know, if you want simple equations, uh, we can just multiply by that constant, and you get a somewhat simpler looking expression. Right, so we're moving in the x direction proportional to qs. We're moving in the y direction proportional to ps, and those are fixed. We're just driving along. And then in the z direction, we have this simple formula. Uh, and uh, so what we'll do next time is generalize this to arbitrary reflectance map, not just uh, Hopkit-type surfaces. So. And please uh, do have a look online for pictures of scanning electron microscope, uh, uh, images taken by scanning electron microscope. They're, they're really neat. and they provide nice examples of uh, shading and our ability to in interpret shading. So. <laughs>